a great pleasure to have uh, our speaker today, Adesha Degrini, who's the assistant professor in plant sciences. I think he works on a number of different things, uh, especially wildfire, but today he's going to talk about carbon offsets in global drylands. And I was told savannas, but this is from more dry than savannas to me, but uh, anyway, uh, Adam, from yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And as Keshav said, this is definitely on the liberal end of the dry of the dry land. This is actually Sasu's Flay in Namibia. It's one of the oldest deserts on the world. And in fact, it rained a few days before we arrived the first time in a few decades. And these plants were able to uh, pop right back up. Anyways, <clears throat> we have a little bit of technical issues, but that's how you know I'm an ecologist and not a computer scientist. So as Keshav said, I'm in plant sciences. I'm what you classify as an ecologist. And my lab group is broadly interested in understanding and applying sort of mechanistic basic science to real world issues to try to you know, reduce the rate of climate change. And the way that we do this is through three different pathways. We have this basic science in ecology where we're doing experimental manipulations in the field. So for example, burning down a forest and seeing what happens. We're trying to scale this globally using anything from a global data set and doing sort of your standard meta analysis to also running eco dynamic ecosystem models. And then finally, and this is more recent, something that we've been working on over the last few years is collaborating with a few players in the private sector and specifically trying to implement some of our understanding of carbon cycling and the advances that's happening in the academic sphere into our estimates and models of uh, ecosystem carbon cycling. Here, let me just move these guys down. There you go. Okay. I, uh, you, you know, yeah, I can, I can try it again, but I'll show you what it, it doesn't work. It does. Um, Sorry for this that's okay. That's why we were fiddling around with it. So anyways, my research is broadly <laughs> interested in both understanding the, the factors that control the capacity of ecosystems to store carbon. So what are these processes? And then trying to understand how global change is shifting these factors. So how it's affecting the mechanisms and then using that to understand how global change is shifting carbon. And then finally taking that and saying, okay, how do we develop a robust carbon credit scheme? And specifically what I'm interested in is estimating the potential for carbon storage and its permanence, so how long it sticks around. All right, so what factors control the capacity of ecosystems to store carbon? I'm gonna whirl through this. Um, sorry if it, you know if anybody has any questions, please stop me because it's important to understand some of these things. So first, we can think about carbon storage in plants, and really, what determines that is the productivity of the plant, and then its ability to stick around. So you have things like resources controlling the growth of plants, but then also disturbances that can control the amount of plant biomass in that landscape. And obviously people are very interested in understanding this from a global change standpoint, because this is one of the ways that we can offset carbon emissions by you know, restoring forests, planting trees, or avoiding deforestation. In this really nice paper here, essentially constrained our estimates of potential plant growth. And the, they estimated that you could sequester a little over two petagrams of carbon per year if you just threw everything at it and tried to um, plant or grow trees in all the places that you could. But if you try to constrain this in terms of the cost and some other, and some other limitations, it goes down to around 1.6 petagrams of carbon per year. And just to put this in perspective, a petagram is a billion million grams and humans are emitting around 10 petagrams of carbon per year. So this is a substantial chunk of change. If we were able to start sequestering 1.6 petagrams of carbon, that's a lot. Now, soils, the things that are really near and dear to my heart. And with soils, you have to think both about the productivity of plants, because plants are what's 
fixing carbon, there's photosynthesis happening. But then when plants die, when they release exudates into the soil from their roots, that's then what is decomposed and becomes soil organic matter. So you have the constraints by biomass productivity, but you also have constraints by things that control decomposition of that soil organic matter. And that is primarily due to mineralogy. And that's because minerals can influence heavily the rate of decomposition. In a recent paper that we worked on, we took, our, we took some maps of minerals and some bigger data sets looking at the current carbon storage, applied a model to estimate, okay, how much carbon could we store based on what we know about the climate and the minerals there? And we estimated that actually you could potentially sequester one petagram of carbon per year. So there's a lot of variability on any of these numbers when they're estimating carbon sequestration due to management on the global scale. But the important thing here is that it's on a similar order of magnitude to what we could get from trees. And the perhaps more informative thing is the total potential stock. And that's 104 petagrams of carbon. And this is a pretty conservative estimate as well. So what this can tell us is we can look across the globe and say, all right, what's the percent saturation of soil carbon storage capacity? And that's taking the current carbon in the soil and then comparing that to what could be. And you get these nice maps of saying, all right, fantastic. We can store a lot of carbon, but there's heterogeneity across the globe. So dry land ecosystems. I know a lot of people love their rainforests, especially several people here, but I'm not going to talk about rainforests at all. Um, just to give you an idea for the extent of drylands and their importance, I've put up some headlines of really cool papers that I'd recommend reading. So drylands cover about 25 million square kilometers, big chunk of change of the Earth's surface. And actually, <clears throat> They can, they're can they playing an increasingly greater role in determining the interannual variability and how much carbon the, earth the, the land surface takes up, as well as the trajectory. So that's this, these two papers on the left-hand side really hammered that home, showing, hey, drylands, very important for the trajectory of the global carbon cycle. But then these papers on the right, what they highlight is we actually don't know that much about drylands. And part of that is because the majority of the carbon in a dryland is below ground in the soil. So you have a lot of carbon in plant biomass that's in species like grasses, for example. They may grow, but then they can die. So that, sure, it's great. You can, you can detect it from space, you can measure it, but you're not getting the actually, the, you're not getting the most important pool in that system. And that's where we come in. And so we're interested in soil carbon because there's an estimated very high potential to store carbon, but it's incredibly unconstrained. So there's some papers that have been published over the last few decades that have estimated the potential soil carbon debt due to humans. One of them is most notably agriculture. So this paper on the left, Sanderman et al., what they estimated was that since the you know, uh, the agricultural revolution, humans have depleted soil carbon stocks by about 100 petagrams. In that number, that's pretty nice because that's somewhat of an independent, um, um, independent validation of what we estimated when we looked at it from the mineral standpoint. So we're at least on similar magnitudes. So if you take these maps of historical losses and you take a map of saying something like, okay, what could we store if we were to maximize things like biomass inputs, you can begin to constrain our understanding of, okay, where do we manage systems to store carbon? But one of the big kinks in the chain with storing carbon in drylands is disturbance. So you have fire, global um, fires burn about 5% of the earth's surface each year. That's around, um, around 570 um, million hectares. And the majority of it occurs in drylands, about 70%. So when I talk about a dryland, you think about pasture, savanna grassland, shrubland, also dry forests, so pretty open. And what we found when we looked at the role of fire, it's estimated that repeated burning in drylands is reducing the net primary productivity of the vegetation by about 5%. So 
you have an ecosystem, it's expansive. The growth of plants is very important for the flux of carbon in and out of the land. And you have a disturbance that's changing that flux. Uh, and so we wanted to understand, okay, what does the effect of changes in that disturbance mean for the effect of changes in the total carbon stored in that system? So this is where I'll get into some uh, of our actual current projects and some data. And first I want to talk about what factors control carbon storage in these systems and specifically focusing on the capacity to store it in soils. And so what we did, and sorry that I keep looking at the screen because I'm looking at my blank desktop here. So I actually have no idea what slide I'm on. Um, <laughs> anyway, so for this, we're talking about a global analysis of fire effects on soil organic matter. What does this mean? Well, all of these different dots here are sites where people have been manipulating fire, meaning they've been burning areas at multiple frequencies anywhere from 20 to 60 years. So we're looking at timescales that are relevant for things like, okay, what's the climate gonna look like in 2050? What's it gonna look like in 2100? And we have this network of 53 sites. They span a good amount of uh, the distribution of global drylands. And they're really, really impressive experiments. And the reason for this is the scale that they're operating at. So these are the experimental burn plots of Kruger National Park, which is in South Africa. It's a beautiful savanna. And these plots here are about seven hectares in size. And you can see they've broken up the landscape, they put in fire breaks, and they're burning these plots of different frequencies and intensities. Sorry, these fire manipulation experiments, um, are these for like, like where I'm from, um, in Utah, sometimes they'll kind of preemptively burn uh, parts of the forest in a controlled way just to get rid of. Mm -hmm. So like, is, is, that, is that what we're talking about, or are there other reasons to um, so these experiments would be used to test something like to, to base that management decision off of. Oh. So these experiments are set up like literally from a basic science perspective of what happens when we burn at different frequencies and different intensities. And so then you have people that are doing research like on these plots, for example, people are interested in fire intensity and wildfire mitigation. They're also interested in herbivore behavior. Um, and that's generally what these experiments are. They were set up, you know, a lot of them are set up in the 50s. They were set up for different reasons. In the case of Kruger, they wanted to understand how frequently they needed to burn the park to maximize vegetation productivity in the maintenance of mega fauna. So herbivores. Makes sense. That's what was making the money. Anyways, so you have people there, and these are dozens of researchers, and these grants are multi-million dollar grants to keep these things going. So I'm kind of a leech on all of this. I just piggyback on these experiments, but they will measure the characteristics of fire, and then they'll monitor the response of the ecosystem. So looking at both vegetation as well as soils. So what we did is we looked across those 53 sites, and we said, okay, we have different fire frequency treatments. How much carbon or is it, uh, how much carbon's in the soil in the plots that burn frequently relative to the plots that don't burn frequently? Pretty straightforward. So what you're looking at here on the y-axis is percent soil organic carbon and burn relative to unburned plots. Anything below this dot, this dashed line, fire reduced carbon in the soil. Anything above it, fire increased it. On the x-axis, you're looking at an aridity index. So on the left hand, it's semi-arid. Right hand, we got hyperhumid. In aridity index, it's essentially taking into account the potential evapotranspiration, so how much water can be lost from it, as well as the mean annual precipitation, so how much water is there. And this is a much more reliable measure of water availability for plants than just something like mean annual precipitation. Because you can imagine, an area that gets the same amount of annual precipitation, but if it's 45 degrees Celsius versus 20 degrees Celsius, you're gonna have very different water balances. So what we found was that in these drier areas, soil carbon was far more sensitive to fire, i.e. the plots lost a lot more carbon when you burn them frequently. And we were able to identify the mechanism as actually being because the effect of fire on tree biomass and in inputs into the soil was also greater. So 
On the y-axis, you're looking at fire-driven losses of soil carbon from trees. How you measure this is pretty cool. You analyze the isotopic composition of carbon. And the reason why you can use carbon isotopes is because trees have the C3 photosynthetic pathway. Grasses in um, tropic and semi-arid regions have a C4 photosynthetic mm -hmm. pathway. And the only thing that matters for this talk is that they have different signatures on the type of carbon that's present in the soil. So you can go in, you can measure that isotopic composition and say X percent came from trees, Y percent came from grasses. And it, what we found on in the semi-arid sites is that those are the areas where we saw the greatest losses of tree biomass inputs into the soil. And as a consequence, we inferred that these drier sites are losing more soil carbon when they're burning frequently because there's some resource constraint on the ability of the trees to regrow and put biomass back into the soil through litter production or turnover of roots. And this makes a lot of sense. So grasses, they're pretty resilient. They're recovering every few years. So it makes sense that these changes in trees would be really driving the shifts in soil carbon. So, we can then do this, do a more formal analysis. So yeah. Could this collect the previous? Yes. In some cases, you see a gain in the biomass, right? After, yep. Uh, you, you, so in humid areas, the trees are gaining even though it's a spire, or I'm kind of thinking, so on the right side, you're not about fire at all anymore. You're just looking at heredity. Oh, sorry, it is fire driven losses or gains. Yes. Exactly. So positive is gain, negative is loss. Yeah. And so you're saying that in a hyperhumid condition, uh, you actually have gain? So I would say that it's just one point. Okay. But you can, the reason why you can get gains is because you can increase the productivity of certain plants that are there. You can change the composition of plants. And so there's, there, are a lot of mechanisms that would lead to greater amounts of carbon in the soil, as well as higher productivity of trees. For example, if they're competing with grasses, okay. then yeah, reducing grass biomass during burns would give- Okay, so it's not net biomass, it's just tree derived biomass. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yes. So it's, that's it, okay, got it. But there's also going to be on diversity of the biomass, right? Yeah. So but diversity might reduce dramatically by one species. Yeah, so absolutely, right. absolutely. And so you can see that with like the colonization of acacias that are very productive and produce a lot of below ground biomass. So we did look at this using uh, formal statistics where we, the, the way that you analyze this in ecology, it's called a meta-analysis where essentially you take the studies and their average effect size, and then you weight it based on the replication in that study. You know, not everything's created equal, as well as the error and variability within that study. So what we found when we looked at model selection, so we're trying to under, understand the most parsimonious model, so including as few predictor variables as possible to maximize our actual prediction of the effect. And I'm happy to talk about that more. And what we found is that the top seven variables or seven variables were in the top model. So you only needed them to explain the maximum amount of variance. It was about 87% of the variance was explained, which is pretty impressive in ecology when you're looking global. And what we found was that you have a whole range of variables, both the vegetation type. So this would get at, you know, Keshav and, and Neil's point that matters, but also really water availability in temperature. Those are coming out as the dominant variables. And then I'll make one point here, soil texture is important. And the reason for this is because it goes back to this whole concept of mineral stabilizing soil organic matter. When you have a lot of sand, the organic matter isn't stabilized by the minerals that are there because it's very coarse. If you have a lot of silt or clay, that's when you have a lot of open surfaces for bonds to form in the organic matter to be stabilized. So the nice thing is that all of these variables make some ecological sense. At least we can convince ourselves that they make sense. We'll see if the reviewers are convinced. It's their review, but it's up as a preprint. And yeah, take it, you know, you're, feel free to look at it. So what we did is we said, okay, we got our statistical model. We have global maps of the distribution of savannas and grasslands. We have global maps of all of those variables that I just talked about. 
So we can take our model, we can fit it to the, we, we can predict the potential change in soil carbon with altered fire regimes using these environmental variables. And then we can constrain the degree to which fire is altered using global maps of, or based on satellites of the trends in burned area. And those come primarily from the MODIS satellite and they go back to the, over the past two decades or so. So what we did is we took our model, we predicted, okay, what's the percent change in soil carbon with declining frequency? And so this is very similar to the concept of gains in carbon in trees when you reduce you know, harvesting. And what we found was that if you just go to the areas where fire frequency is already declining, meaning peat land managers are burning it less because they're planting more crops or they're, they change their grazing regime. In those cases, you can sequester around 80 teragrams of carbon per year. Now, some of you are probably thinking like 80 teragrams, what is, you know, is that Skittles or is it the whole roast? Well, to put it in perspective, boreal forests sequester about 80 ter teragrams of carbon per year in their soils. So if you look at the carbon sink of the world's forests, uh, boreal forests are a heavy hitter in that, and a large part of it is their soils. So this number means a lot in terms of the global carbon cycle. And again, we can take it one step further and say, okay, what if we shut off fire across dry lands globally, which is highly unlikely because it's a dominant form of land use in these systems? Well, there you can almost double your sink. So the important thing here is that you're getting big numbers and you're able to predict it using these statistical models. Now, any good, excuse me, ecologist would say, sure, you have your statistical model, but this is garbage for forecasting in the future because oftentimes the model that you, the data that you're parameterizing it on, you're going to be trying to forecast outside of the parameter space that your model was trained on. So that's why we build process-based models. Unfortunately, the process-based models that we have available aren't that good, or at least several of them are not good. And so what we did is we simulated the change in fire as well as you know across the entire globe, so everything that I showed you before. And we use seven dynamic global vegetation models. So it says vegetation in there, soils included as well. And these models here, they are all the heavy hitters that go into things like IPCC simulations and forecasting, you know, what is the world going to look like? And we can compare our empirical data, which are the black dots, to all the different model scenarios. And these are just averages within the model. You know, the, the, the spread can be big. But the key thing is that only two of them reconstructed the important trend of fire effects being greater in the drier systems. So in many cases, we think this is because the models are overestimating the resilience of trees in these systems. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, they can overestimate CO2 fertilization effects, which tend to be greater in drier systems. So this is one thing that we're digging into currently that I'm happy to talk about more. But unfortunately for now, we need to rely on these statistical um, models that we've produced. And one reason why these dynamic global vegetation models may not predict the effect of fire well is because they were built using an understanding of soil organic matter dynamics that's really undergone a big paradigm shift in the uh, last few decades. And the old paradigm is basically that plants control everything. You have higher plant biomass, you get more soil carbon. And as a consequence, fire reduces plant biomass, you have less soil carbon. However, when I was talking about the minerals and their role in stabilizing soil organic matter, that's increasingly shown to be more and more important. And instead, you need to, you don't just care about the inputs into soils, but you care about the losses from soils, primarily via decomposition. So there's a paper that came out in Nature a few years back where they showed that CO2 fertilization drove actually resulted in losses of soil organic matter. And that's because of a stimulation of decomposition. So like 
capturing this component here is actually very important. And we've done a lot of work over the past few years, basically showing how in certain conditions, fire and its effect on soil carbon really needs to have this new paradigm. Okay, so just to summarize, repeated disturbances reduce carbon storage in soil, largely linked to water constraints on plant productivity, but there's clearly a role for soils. And we need to improve our process-based models. All right. This hopefully will be more interesting to you guys because that's deal with satellites and a bunch of data and stuff like that. I know answers, I know zero answers to these questions because I'm going to be presenting on work done by my graduate student and postdoc. And I, I had their names on the title slide. I was flustered. I didn't mention them. But Johanna Scharnecker is a PhD student in my lab. She's doing all the stuff on wildfires in the Western US. And Sarah Baker is a postdoc in my lab. She's doing everything on fires in UK peatlands. Now, the key thing here is this drying component because these are not necessarily classical drylands, but they are systems that are drying very quickly. So what we did here is we used satellites and we used remote sensing of wildfires. In the case of the Western US, it's all based on the Landsat satellite series. So this goes back to the mid 1980s. Johan has reconstructed this to 2020. She has a data set of 1,300 wildfires. It's about 30 million pixels that she's tracking through time. So you can do all sorts of cool analyses like, all right, what's the burn severity, but also what determines the ability of these forests to regrow, which is really cool. So why do we care about wildfires in the Western US forests? Drying conditions, making hotter fires, you're releasing carbon from the forest, it's not serving as a sink and consequently as a source of carbon in the atmosphere. Fire in the UK peatlands, I'm giving away the punchlines here. The emergence of a new wildfire season because of drying conditions is resulting in big emissions. So they're gonna be two different stories. So what's happening in the Western US? Well, burned area is going up and it's largely because of greater fuel aridity. So, what this paper did, and there's several papers done by this group that have really hammered home, not just rising aridity causing greater forest fires, but that humans in our uh, human driven climate change is what's leading to the rising aridity. So here you have fuel aridity. So how dry the stuff that burns actually is. And then the burned area in that year across the entire Western US. And the key thing here is that all of these points, despite being different colors, which means they came from different periods of time, they all follow along the same line. But the key thing is that when you look at mid 80s to late 90s, they all tend to be on the less arid end of the distribution. Whereas the, the last few years, especially 2020, which was a crazy fire year in the Western US, drier. And this is just a, a probability dense. Um, probability density plot showing that the aridity has changed. However, the trends in severity and resilience of vegetation are either at very coarse spatial scales or they're constrained to a handful of wildfires. So you'll see people that'll look at Landsat imagery and analyze how the fire and the vegetation recovery through time, but that's based on just a few fires. Or when you look at these continental scales where they look at, all right, the severity of wildfires, they would be doing things like averaging the severity within an entire wildfire rather than getting real high, high uh, resolution. So where Johanna is working is in the Sierra Nevada mountains. This is in California, so the United States. And this, these are the Sierras in all of these colors. That's all area that has been burned. So sometimes people think forest fires are a recent phenomenon, but these forests, they burn naturally. It's just that the fires have gotten a lot bigger and hotter. And what you get when you look at these fires from the Landsat satellites is first a fire perimeter. And so this is developed by the U.S. government and heavily influenced by people in California going out and mapping this. So you have this fire perimeter. But then you take Landsat measurements of basically what an area looked like before the fire and what it looked like after the fire. And depending on 
how much its color swung from, you know, just think about it, how black it got from how green it was, you get a burn severity. In, in this case, everything that's a cooler color, that's a higher severity burn. And so you can see that just looking at this fire, there's all, all sorts of cool spatial trends and fire severity. And you can create these probability density plots of fire severity to begin to characterize these fires. So sure, you know, there's a big wildfire, but how much of it was a severe burn? How much was a, a less severe burn? And what determines the patches of severe fires? And for those of you that don't know Landsat, it's at a resolution of like 30 by 30 meters. So pretty good for forest wildfires. One key thing that Johanna's finding is that high severity wildfires are more extensive in the past decade. So if you're colorblind and you can't see any of these colors and you look at the rise in burned area, so that's uh, on the y-axis, total burned area in hectares, this is exactly what you'd expect. Wildfires going, or the amount of burned air is going up. But the really cool thing is by identifying the areas in the fire that are burned at different severities, and this is a continuous measurement, but we've just categorized it into discrete, um, or classified it into discrete categorizations. You can look at the area uh, that's experienced different severities. And what you can see in the past Sure, you had high severity burn areas, but they were kind of blips, right? In some years, there was virtually none. But then over time, especially in 2020, there's an increasing area that's burned in these very severe fires. So, and so un unburned there means it's an area you can't do, but it, it completely escaped burning. So, yeah, that, that's a great question. So, basically, when the U.S. goes out and maps where a fire is, they produce a forest perimeter, and that's essentially a shape file that they put up. And so what when you look at analyses that come out and say, oh, this is the burned area that's changed through time, they're based on the total area of that. Whereas what Johanna's doing is she's analyzing, sure, you know, maybe it burned, but it doesn't look any different the next year than it looked before it burned. So that's one thing she's trying to figure out now is how to deal with those types of dynamics. Yes. Does the proportion of high severity to the total area of burn change? So that's uh, that's a great question. That's one analysis she's yeah. working on now. Um, and well, I've got to I've got to pick up the pace. But one really cool thing that she started to find is that. If you look at the distribution of severity within a fire, it seems to be that there are sort of three types of fires that's happening in the Sierras. First, you have your log normal distribution. So on the x-axis is burn severity. On the y-axis is just a count so that it's like a smooth histogram. And what you can see when you have this log normal, Sure, you have some big patches of high severity, but for the most part, it's even there's a bunch of distributed high severity um, patches, and it would be what we'd call like a pretty patchy fire. Now, you have your bimodal burns, where you see certain areas in the fire that just got totally scorched, and it was a continuous burn. There's probably some really nice spatial propagation dynamics going on there, but then there's also areas that burn to very low severities. And then you have your right skewed fires, where just the entire burned area got torched. So, you know, these she literally produced these a few days ago. We don't know why you see these different fires, um, but one cool thing that she's doing is she's actually reclassifying the vegetation um, based on, you know, the different classification techniques that she can talk about uh, uh, if you guys are interested, because she's certainly interested in... Wouldn't the time of the fire make a difference if it was a rainfall previously or not? Yep. So there wasn't yet the certain days. Yeah, absolutely. And so she's pulling in um, all the data on, well, she has pulled in the data on like vapor pressure deficit and these estimates of aridity. And she went out and did field work this past summer, and a lot of it's driven by topography in what types of vegetation you have. So California produces this map of vegetation, but it's updated very infrequently. And in fact, it's not updated in between fires. So when researchers go out and they do these big regional analyses and they say, 
okay, this forest type is responsible for, you know, multiple fire events and trends in severity. Well, they're actually assuming that that forest type has not changed since the last fire. So anyways, you can see why there's a challenge with that. So Johanna's um, doing a lot of really interesting classification stuff that I know nothing about. So mega fires. Sometimes we hear about these in the news. They're a big hot topic. Uh, terrible pun. They're, they are a headline grabber. And the key thing here is that you have two examples of mega fires, and these guys are very charismatic fires in California that killed people, caused billions of dollars of damage. Even though they burned similar amounts of area, they were very different in their severity, right? So here you have your bimodal fire, the north complex, then you have your campfire that's much more of a log normal. So we think that there's actually a lot of really cool um, information that you can get by looking at within fire patterns in severity. So one thing that we're working on in collaboration with some people out West uh, at Stanford is trying to use these data to understand the permanence and the size of buffer pools that you need if you were investing in a forest. So you may have heard, you know, Microsoft as well as other companies had a bunch of carbon credits that they had tied up in Western US forests. Unfortunately, a lot of those forests burn, and so they lost a lot of their offsets. Now, one reason for this is because the way that the, the regulations or guidance for carbon credits is structured is it doesn't take into account any of our actual understanding of disturbances in these forests. So what do I mean by that? You may say you want to sequester X amount of carbon. And so they'll, the, and, and then you'll go to a land area. They tell you, all right, we can give you this amount of carbon. And then there'll be some requirement to have a buffer pool. So what happens if that area actually burns down, is in a drought, gets cut down, whatever? Well, they have that as a fixed percentage. And you can understand why that's bad, but what we're trying to do is use an understanding of both determining what, whether or not a fire occurs, as well as how severe that burn is, because if it's a low severity fire, that's okay, your carbon's still going to be there. And then by looking at the probability or likelihood of that carbon being lost, you can determine, you can back calculate the buffer pool needed to deliver on a particular project. So this is one thing we're pretty excited about, and I'm happy to talk more at the end. Sarah Baker's work, and I'll fly through this because there's it's just a, a little bit of information from the UK, because again, this is hot off the, hot off the shelf. So she's interested in fires and temperate peatlands, and the way that people quantify carbon emissions from fire is through a pretty simple equation. Emissions equal fuel load times area burned times combustion completeness times emission factors. And when this is done at the global scale, you've got to make some assumptions. And so models are generally run to uh, understand what type of vegetation is there, how much vegetation is there. And then there are these coefficients that are put in for combustion completeness and emission factors. So it takes satellite data, it takes global maps, and essentially what Sarah's done is she's taken very high resolution maps in the United Kingdom, especially of peatlands in their distribution in the depth of peat. And what she's found is that over time, total area burn actually hasn't changed that much. Sure, you get series of years where fires are burning a greater amount of area in the UK, but you know what our worst burned area year was back in 2003. And so this is the total burnt area, uh, the orange line. Oh, and, and these are also derived from satellites. Um, they're operating at a 500 meter resolution. But then we can also take peatland classifications in the United Kingdom and say, all right, are those fires actually occurring on peatlands? Because that's one thing that you hear about is burning of peat and how that's causing these big carbon emissions and the drying out of peat. But to my understanding, there has been no quantitative evaluation of that. So peat burnt area, still a relatively low fraction of total burnt area, but 
when you take into account how dense the carbon is in that peatland, it packs a wall up in terms of emissions. And to put this in perspective, when you have a really bad fire year, so 2019, the emissions from burning on peatlands is about 0.7, not about, it was 0.7 megatons of carbon dioxide. And this is equivalent to emissions uh, around 10% of the emissions that we get from UK croplands. So, you know, it's not like all of a sudden the biggest cause of CO2 mm -hmm. flux from the land, but it's a, a big number. And we're, I'm happy to talk about how this is estimated. We take into account um, remote sensing estimates of things like soil moisture and how that determines fuel combustion. PhD student Juliana Coli, she's keeping our heads in the dirt a little bit by trying to actually do these measurements of carbon losses from wildfires. So we are, we're going to ground our remote sensing data in actual field data. All right, shifting wildfire regimes, it's not really going to be anything good for the amount of carbon stored in an ecosystem, but there's a lot of really cool advances in remote sensing that are allowing us to constrain our estimates and inform these carbon credit programs, hopefully if people listen to us, which they may not. <clears throat> so now I want to talk about how can we actually implement robust carbon credit schemes. And again, robust, I'm talking about potential and permanence. And so this is funded by, uh, it was funded by the European Research Council, but, you know, the UK, EU can't really play well together in the same sandbox. So now it's funded by the UK <laughs> Research and Innovation. But essentially, the end goal that we're trying to do is develop a carbon credit scheme for rangelands. So this is taking everything from empirical work to understanding fire and grazing and its effect on carbon, developing new models that can predict it well. And then we're working with a few companies that are trying to implement this in their rangelands. So one's a big agricultural company that's directly paying land managers. And then another one is a uh, estimate of potential and verification company. And another one is a marketplace. So we're hoping to plug and play our model into their estimates. I have two PhD students that just started, Robert Powell and Dave Incarnation, that are looking at variants of this. Dave is really interested in trade-offs between crop yield as well as using life cycle analyses to account for full supply chain carbon emissions. Robert's really interested in basically mapping potential carbon sequestration. This is what the global rangelands look like. All the red, they estimate that it's degraded rangeland. So the idea here is that we can, there's an opportunity to manage these things that can degrade a rangeland, like overgrazing to frequent burning over a large area. So it's not like we're coming in and saying, totally change the system for the worse. We're hoping it'll also change it for the better. So as hopefully I convinced you in the first chunk of my talk, it's complicated to try to understand how fire is changing soil organic matter. And we've done this piecewise in a variety of papers. And we know plants are important. We know decomposition in the soil is important. We know climate's important. But in order to capture all this, we're going to go to 15 sites. So 15 of these different fire manipulation experiments. And we're going to measure just about everything in the ecosystem that you'd need to quantify the carbon cycling and nitrogen cycling and parameterize a model. So rather than piecing together data from the literature, things that people have already collected, we're going to go and collect this, and then we're going to do it again the next year, and then again the next year to try to get an idea for temporal consistency. A postdoc will be leading this. Then we're going to work on developing this model. And my group does a little bit of process-based modeling, but um, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to run these process-based models on global scale. So we're collaborating with some people at Imperial, as well as Lawrence Livermore back in the US. And the idea is, remember when I was talking about the new paradigm of soil organic matter modeling? That's that, is measuring pools of carbon in the soil. And there's a lot of really cool analyses that we'll be doing, like measuring 14C on um, the soil organic matter to date it. And then finally, implementation. Are rangelands a viable nature-based solution? So this is where it comes into collaborating with agricultural companies. 
Because if you're going to go out and tell a land manager to sequester more carbon and adjust their management, you need to understand the trade-offs and consequently how you incentivize um, the manager to change their management and sequester carbon. So this here is just a conceptual schematic where we estimate that if you change fire and you change stocking densities, those are the two levers that you can alter, you can change carbon. But this is being developed in across the entire United States. So rangelands and the beef industry, that actually accounts, that's the largest contributor to agricultural revenue in the US. And then finally, all my acknowledgements. Sorry if I flew through some of that and for my uh, technical difficulties, blame it on Steve Jobs. Um, but <laughs> a wonderful number of uh, collaborators have supported all of us. Thanks. <laughs> Yes. Sorry if I misunderstood this, but I think you were saying at some point that we can use um, estimates of wildfire area and severity to back calculate buffer time. Mm -hmm. Does it also make sense to project out wildfire risk in terms of both severity and area, and then the projection will help what a good size of buffer fuel could be? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's part of why we're, that that's part of that final project that I just talked about. So generally what you should do is you should take the whole ensemble of potential climate change estimates from models under different emission scenarios. This would be if you had an academic that was, you know, had years to blow and <clears throat> say, all right, what are my fire likelihoods under this range of scenarios? then you can integrate that into these sort of probabilistic analyses of what's the potential that I'm losing carbon. And I'm actually working with someone at um, Cornell who does a lot of these uncertainty analyses. And so he's helping us think through, you know, not just, hey, is a project gonna lose, but how can you structure a project to deliver? Um, so yeah, great question. All the fire mitigation. How does that yeah, uh, that's another great question. So we're we're actually working with a private equity company of all things that does fire management and investment in U in Western U.S. for us. And one big thing that they're interested in is. Pay, like how carbon payment schemes can be funneled through these land managers to burn the forest and reduce wildfire severity. That definitely will reduce severity, but it's just not possible to implement on like the spatial scale that you'd need to really reduce emissions. It can be highly effective at like wildland urban interfaces and making sure the fires don't burn into towns for sure. But you know you're not going to go out to the Sierras and do it um, completely. Does that make sense? Um, you don't have people to do so, or money. Yeah. So, so the wildfires that and I, I agree I agree with you, but the government's incredibly inefficient with how they spend money. God knows, like think about San Francisco and the amount of tax revenue they get and the homeless problem they have. It's like, clearly there's, yeah, there's a disconnect. I, And that would be a really cool optimization analysis of looking through, all right, where's the money that can be spent to reduce fire risk? Because we know the costs of wildfire. So yeah, be a neat analysis. Out of curiosity, what the you guys So, Blue Forest. Okay. Yeah. Very small. On, on the note of um, the cost of these wildfires, is there, is there a significant land use land classification change after the wildfire that results in it? You know, like, does more of the land become agricultural or just wasteland or eventually regenerate forest? Yeah. So a lot of that, I mean, it's so variable in how severe the fire is. And one cool thing, if like from an ecological standpoint, is the way that a lot of these forests in the Western U.S. regenerate is by propagules in seed rain 
And the further you are from the edge of an unburned forest, the longer it takes. It's like a diffu you know, diffusion kernel, dispersal kernel. And as a consequence, when you have these more homogenous burns, you have lower recovery. Yeah, so. Really no one has system. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So you can No, I was asking about the recovery rate, so we just go with it. Yeah, and I will say, Johanna, that's the next step in her analysis is looking at characterizing these different shapes of recovery as well. You know, is it transitioning to a different vegetation state? Is it recovering at, you know, faster, slower rates? How does that depend on the climate versus fire severity? And just like the number of events, like you have a lot of like low severity, but yeah. you have like a lot of times so that you have like one severity once and like how is the difference of recovery which one is worse yeah and so the that that's another nice thing about having such a long satellite record is she's looking at reburns too and uh, one of the areas in the western u.s that she went to has a lot of these prescribed fires like sequoia and king's canyon and so Hopefully we'll have some answers to that. Yeah, it certainly reduces wildfire severity, like a low fire, um, a low severity fire that comes through or a prescribed burn will reduce like subsequent severity if a wildfire burns through it. So we have some people waiting for the last question. Can you talk to them? Yeah. 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 Yeah, we could have wrapped it right now. Yeah. Well, for a few minutes. For a few minutes. For a few minutes. Thank you.